a reading from the first book of Kings. The queen of Sheba, having heard of Solomon's fame, came to test him with subtle questions. She arrived in Jerusalem with a very numerous retinue and with camels bearing spices, a large amount of gold and precious stones. She came to Solomon and questioned him on every subject in which she was interested. King Solomon explained everything she asked about, and there remained nothing hidden from him that he could not explain to her. When the, king, when the queen of Sheba witnessed Solomon's great wisdom, the palace he had built, the food at his table, the seating of his ministers, the attendance and garb of his waiters, his banquet service, and the burnt offerings he offered in the temple of the Lord, she was breathless. The report I heard in my country about your deeds and your wisdom is true, she told the king, though I did not believe the report until I came and saw with my own eyes. I have discovered that they were not telling me the half. Your wisdom and prosperity surpass the report I heard. Blessed are your men, blessed these servants of yours, who stand before you always and listen to your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God, whom it has pleased to place you on the throne of Israel. In his enduring love for Israel, the Lord has made you king to carry out judgment and justice. Then she gave the king 120 gold talents, a very large quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again did anyone bring such an abundance of spices as the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. The mouth of the just murmurs wisdom. Commit to the Lord your way. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make justice dawn for you like the light. Bright as the noonday shall be your vindication. The mouth of the just man tells of wisdom, and his tongue utters what is right. The law of his God is in his heart, and his steps do not falter. The salvation of the just is from the Lord. He is their refuge in time of distress. And the Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Dominus vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Lexio sancti evangelii secundum marcum. Gloria ti in nomine. Jesus summoned the crowd again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. 
Nothing that enters one from outside can defile that person, but the things that come out from within are what defile. When he got home away from the crowd, his disciples questioned him about the parable. He said to them, Are even you likewise without understanding? Do you not realize that everything that goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach and passes out into the latrine? Thus he declared all foods clean. But what comes out of the man, that is what defiles him. From within the man, from his heart, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from within, and they defile. Verbum to homini. Today, Jesus tells us that nothing that enters one from outside can defile that person, but the things that come out from within are what defile. And today, he's speaking about uh, the different uh, foods and, and the kosher laws. And I think Father Mitch addressed this yesterday about the washing of hands that occurred earlier in chapter 7. This is 7, uh, verse 14. Uh, the Pharisees questioned Jesus about why his disciples do not wash before eating or coming from the marketplace or, or many of the different various kinds of ritual ablutions that the Pharisees observed. And Jesus, we know his criticism of them is that they leave the commandments of God and hold fast to the traditions of men. That the Torah given to Moses uh, versus the oral tradition of interpretation which developed and grew alongside the Torah. And we know that the Pharisees extended uh, some of the washings and purifications that priests would observe to the laity. And Jesus' criticism of them is that they miss the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy. The Pharisees focus on the external, but Jesus wants to bring about a real transformation of the heart. And that's really the key word in these passages. Today it's mentioned twice, heart, the word heart, and um, yesterday it was mentioned as well in the gospel a little bit earlier. So he tells us, out of the heart comes the evil thoughts, uh, the unchastity, the theft, murder, adultery, greed, the whole list, you know, the evils that, that, that are within our heart that come from within are what makes us impure. So. We know this from the Sermon on the Mount that the heart is the focus for Jesus. You know, he gives God's interpretation of the law, right? The Pharisees were giving another very external focus, but he tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, not only, you know, thou shalt not kill, but you shall not have this hatred for your brothers and sisters. Not only shall you not have, a, you know, commit adultery, but you shall not look upon a woman with lust and that you should forgive your enemies, turn the other cheek. This is all a teaching that's aimed at the renewal of the heart. We know in the Bible that the heart is the center of man, his spiritual center. Von Balthasar said that it's the organ by which we see God. He tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. This is our center where we give our fundamental primacy to God, our fiat, that surrender to God happens in the heart. Paul Benedict describes the heart as where understanding, will, and feeling, body and soul, all come together. Will, feeling, and understanding become one in the knowledge and love of God, our core, our very center. Sister Elvira, the founder of the Chinacolo communities, she said that only God's love can transform the human heart. Only God's love can transform it. Not the external, but when we receive God's love, that's what 
makes us new. How do we overcome the pull of sin? All these, this list that Jesus gives us, the hardening of our hearts, our fallen human nature, how can we overcome this tendency to sin? We all experience the pull of sin. It has a gravity upon us, a constant force that pulls us down, that works on us. And maybe a lot of times we don't even notice it, right? Because we're, we constantly live in it, like normal gravity, right? We don't pay attention to normal gravity, but maybe if you've ever been to a theme park, you're on one of those rides that spin you around or something, you feel the force of gravity or the pull outward in the, on the ride, all of a sudden you, you, know, you experience this new force, you become aware of it. Or if you ever like swam in a river, you know, and floated down with the current and then tried to stand up in the current, you feel the force of the river then. And it's the same, I think it's true with sin. When we try to fight it, that's when we really experience its pull. If we're floating along with it, it's no big deal. Or a riptide, maybe if you ever go to the beach and you have waves crashing in and at some point along the beach, that water's got to go back out and they call that the riptide. <clears throat> and I remember one time I was swimming at a beach and um, I'm a good swimmer, but I, you, that riptide is exhausting. You're supposed to swim parallel to the beach to, to get out of it. Well, sin is like that, right? We can't overcome it by fighting it. We can't overcome it of ourselves. We can't overcome it through philosophy, right? St. Augustine speaks about this. He studied uh, many different philosophies and he realized their shortcomings. You know, knowledge can't overcome it. Even knowing myself and even knowing my weaknesses, certainly that helps us in our spiritual battle, but that's not enough. You know, we do grow in self-knowledge, but I need something more than that. Or even human effort. Even if we're very disciplined, and sometimes some of us can be disciplined about many areas, but there's usually something, some predominant fault, right, that we can't overcome with our discipline. Or maybe a temptation for us today is technology. You know, that technology is a great good and has helped mankind, but it it can't save us, it can't overcome this, it can't bring about this inner transformation. Or economics, right? We have a big focus today on what's the right economic system to have. And certainly in justice and charity, we want good economic solutions, right? We have a, there's a great moral imperative for that, but the perfect economic system isn't going to get away, isn't going to extinguish greed from the human heart, right? That is still going to be there. We need God's love. That's what transforms our hearts. That's what draws us to him, that overcomes this gravity uh, that sin pulls on us. You know, Jesus tells us in John's gospel that when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, that he'll lift us out of this sin when he's lifted up on the cross. Jesus does all the heavy lifting for us, right? If you ever moved anything, you know, there's usually one big guy that you give him the heavier side of stuff, and uh, Jesus does that for us, right? He's done it on the cross. The cross is a testimony, it's a statement of his love. We can see his love incarnate in a very physical way when we meditate upon the cross. Not only is it a statement, but it's also the source of our redemption, the redemption of our hearts, that through the Paschal mystery, Jesus gives us a new heart. We know that that is the result, that suffering, death, and rising, he sends us that Holy Spirit when he is, ascends to his Father. And we know that Holy Spirit is given to us and pours charity into our hearts, Romans 5.5. 5. That's what gives us a new heart. We see in the first reading today that Solomon had great wisdom, you know, such wisdom that the Queen of Sheba would come to witness it. But we know later in his life he had many wives who worshipped pagan gods, and they turned his heart to the worship of false gods. And this man who had such incredible wisdom fell. Right? He had the philosophies, the great philosophies and things. And his turning to false gods results in the divided kingdom, an incredible 
punishment. You know, only one tribe of the twelve was of the twelve was left in the southern kingdom. That without God, the kingdom was fractured, and we are fractured, right? When we turn from God, we're fractured by sin. Well, the responsorial psalm today tells us, I think, the solution. What I've been talking about, that God and his love for us is the solution. And the psalmist says, you know, commit to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Simple little phrase, trust in him, not in ourselves, right? Not in that list of things that I, I mentioned. That's the key, turning to him. That's how we overcome the weaknesses, the sins of our heart. That the psalmist tells us salvation is from the Lord. That the Lord helps and delivers us. And it also says that the law of God is in his heart, that the just man has the law of God in his heart, that he meditates on God's law. He meditates on the scriptures. You know, that's how we have this continual contact, this ordinary contact, we could say, with God and his saving mysteries, pondering, contemplating, receiving his truth. That's how we know what to do, but also how we have and foster that contact with God that transforms us. Certainly the sacraments have a pride of place and the meditation of the scriptures, you know, makes us, puts us in this receiving stance towards God, that he can work with us and transform us. We have to have that, that fundamental trust though in him and not in ourselves. And that's how we can live the law of God by allowing him to win that, that victory in us.